Good evening, Woodbridge. Good evening. Oh, we can do better than that here in Woodbridge. Good evening, Woodbridge. All right, alive and well here in Woodbridge, Eastern Prince William. Uh, I am Frank Principe. I am your elected Woodbridge representative on the Prince William Board of County Supervisors. On behalf of that board, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, tonight we are unveiling our current plans for the North Woodbridge Town Center and how we intend to launch commuter fast ferry service out of the Occoquan Marina here. As many of you know, we are busy building new Woodbridge. You don't have to look very far to realize and to see those improvements going on as we speak. New and expanded roads, Many of you had to sit through some of that construction to get here tonight. Expanded new schools, the undergrounding of our utilities, the demolition of, I think, 125 blighted, what I call my ugly buildings, that was not contributing to the tax base here in uh, Prince William, uh, and also private sector infrastructure, including new water, gas, and electric transmission lines throughout Eastern Prince William. For those familiar with the vision of New Woodbridge, you know that the heart and soul of that vision is centered on five town centers along Route 1, along about a seven mile stretch of Route 1. You are at one of those today here in North Woodbridge. We intend to focus our continued growth, our population growth, uh, at those five town centers with a mix of uses, including residential, retail, office, hotel, and sports and recreation at each of the five. So I'll give you a little inside baseball here. New Woodbridge 1.0 is really about bringing those five town centers up out of the ground. And you know them as Potomac Town Center where Wegmans and Apple and REI are at. You also know that it's Potomac Shores further south of here uh, where you'll be able to buy a home and play golf uh, on a bluff overlooking the Potomac River uh, and have its own VRE station. You know it is Neamsco Commons where we have two brand new beautiful Hilton hotels, a future grocery store, a office and residential mixed use. You know it is Belmont Bay where we have residential and a tiny little bit of retail but I'm happy to say now George Mason University at Belmont Bay. North Woodbridge is the least farthest along in the development of those five town centers. But tonight, we're gonna to change all of that with your support, with your comments, your feedback. Uh, we're going to unveil to you the plan for North Woodbridge and specifically how we're going to integrate commuter fast ferry uh, into the town center itself. Second, uh, first, you, uh, there's three presentations tonight. Uh, each one gets shorter, so please don't leave after the second one, because I'm number three. <laughs> the first one will focus on the current plan. Uh, I would consider it a draft until the Board of County Supervisors gets it in the first or second quarter of 2019, consider it still a draft and subject to public input. And that is a presentation on the North Wood Bridge, what we're calling small area plan. The second presentation uh, will be provided to us by a group called ULI, Urban Land Institute. Uh, ULI is an international nonprofit group uh, in, with offices in Washington, D.C. and around the, around the world, actually, uh, who bring together experts. Uh, who have a knowledge and an expert base on building communities. And by building communities, I'm talking about mixed use, transit oriented, uh, and smart growth communities. And then finally, uh, you will have uh, a sneak preview of a report that was published this week after over a year of study, the fourth study with regard to commuter fast ferry. Uh, and you will begin to see and appreciate uh, what's it going to cost, where's it going to go, what kind of boats or vessels are we going to be operating uh, as we move forward on all three fronts.
Once we get through the three presentations, there'll be a lengthy Q&A session. We will be here as long as we need to for that. Uh, and uh, uh, we really encourage all of you to comment tonight, share your views, your questions. And again, this dialogue is just starting. After tonight, I hope to hear from you at Wegmans and by email and by phone calls and at other events and other meetings that we have here uh, in Woodbridge. Uh, and so with that, what I'd like to do is introduce the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker uh, is the director of the Prince William County Planning Department, somebody I have worked with now for a number of years, joined at the hip. Uh, Rebecca Horner uh, is the uh, leader when it comes to planning in the North Woodbridge Town Center uh, and she has a slide deck she's going to walk through uh, and uh, once she's done we're going to move on to our second speaker and then myself and then throw it up in for Q&A. Uh, so that's sort of the process that we're going through tonight. What am I missing? Uh, and before we get started with Ms. Horner, thank you, Megan, I think I, I should probably introduce my own personal staff who have made this uh, event a success already. Uh, and that would be Megan Landis, if you could stand. And you saw her at the front desk. I don't see her in the room. Uh, Bertha Johnson. Uh, Bertha's at the registration Dick and Lisa Krause, the owners of Aquan Harbor, uh, this venue, as well as the Marina and Harbor Grill, have been a really gracious hosts uh, for this and other events that we've done here. But before we get started with Ms. Horner, what I'd like to do is invite the uh, Prince William County uh, Executive, the most senior staff person up, to say a few welcoming remarks. And I think you'll recognize pretty quickly that he's not from around here. He's got a, uh, a career and a lifetime from New York, but that's okay. He's been here long enough that we have made him a honorary Virginian. Uh, and with that, please welcome Chris Martino. Thank you, Mr. Crispy. And, uh, I thought it was off the hook for a second, Megan. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome to everyone. We're glad you're here tonight because this is uh, one of many meetings that Mr. Principe has been holding about how we're going to develop the new uh, Woodbridge. And uh, your input is critical to uh, how we go about doing that. It's a very iterative process, as you're going to see tonight and, and in future meetings. And, and why it's so important is because it will speak to the future. 10, and 15, and 20 years from now, people will think back and, and, and wonder how this came to be, this beautiful new North Woodbridge in this case. And it's your input that's gonna help steer that discussion. The board has adopted strategic goals, and first and foremost uh, of those strategic goals is to develop the Prince William County economic base, to have a robust economy, and that these are critical developments uh, along Route 1 that Mr. Principe mentioned that will contribute to our future economic success. We have a lot of development going on around the county. We have tremendous potential right here in, in this area, and we want to make the most of it. So uh, thank you to the folks from ULI for participating with us, for giving us your input. But uh, really, the, the citizens of Prince William County, your input is going to be critical here as we move forward. So with that, I'll get out of the way and welcome uh, Rebecca to begin her presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I see a lot of familiar faces. We've worked together on this for about a year now, and I'm glad that tonight we can present to you our initial draft. We're still working on it. But I want to say thank you to Supervisor Principe because he's been very supportive of the planning process, very supportive of the, uh, of the growth and, and plan that we um, are working toward in North Woodbridge. He's been a great partner in this process. And without that support, it would make it much more difficult. So we really appreciate that. So right now, um, we'll that up. Um, we're gonna do the weather with the blue screen. We'll do that. <laughs> we are uh, we are in in what I believe is the most dynamic part of the county. It's the most dense. It has the most variety. It has the most amount of uh, 
capital infrastructure investment recently and I believe it also has the most opportunity. So I'm very excited that our office gets to work on this because I believe that I'll be here long enough that I'll get to see the actual transition of North Woodbridge and as a planner that's very exciting. Uh, so I mentioned uh, we're working on the North Woodbridge small area plan. It's part of the comprehensive plan update. We do this once every 10 years. It's a 20 year plan. So we're currently working on the Prince William County 2040 plan. And uh, as part of that plan, we're developing some small area plans. With it. And the first one that we'll be working on uh, taking to the board is the North Woodbridge plan. And we started that process about a year ago with many of you in this room. And it was a very uh, uh, vigorous, um, enthusiastic, dedicated group of people who came together two evenings uh, during the week, and I think it was cold, and, uh, but we were very dedicated to the process and we got a lot of great feedback, which we've incorporated into our draft, but I have to I'd say again, it is a draft. We will have another public meeting after this. We wanted to coordinate with the Urban Land Institute's work in this panel, so uh, we're a little ahead of when we probably would have unveiled it, but we've gotten it to a point where it's, uh, it's ready to share with you and um, encourage your feedback. We have a mobile app that we, uh, I think Supervisor Principe will send out in his newsletter how to download that app and you can actually provide comment directly into that app after tonight if you have some thoughts. Um, and again, look for that public meeting that we'll have to unveil the final draft, which will incorporate the comments that we hear from the Urban Land Institute tonight because I believe they're going to have some great feedback as well. Uh, we've hired a consultant in this process, and the consultant will actually give you this presentation. His name is Dan Hardy. He's with the Renaissance Planning <coughs> Group, and he's been a great partner with us. Uh, they have a lot of experience in work, working in dynamic, mixed-use urban development. So with that, we'll let Dan speak. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm very pleased to be here and glad to see so many people here tonight. Um, I do want to just speak uh, fairly, fairly briefly about uh, the background for the planning process. Many of you know um, what we've kind of come up with so far, building upon your input, um, some of the functional elements and ideas that we're putting forward in the plan, uh, how that plan will be implemented over time, and some of the next steps in the process of the plan. Um, one piece of background that uh, some of you probably already know is that uh, North Woodbridge is one of uh, about 10 small area plans that the county has embarked upon. And as the executive mentioned, the real key here is focusing on economic development. And another key that is something that's happening throughout the region is a recognition that we are running out of land. Uh, we've had many decades of greenfield development throughout the region, including Prince William County. And now the focus is on trying to uh, you know, kind of grow a little bit uh, smarter, a little bit more vertical, and focus development in the places that are best suited, like North Woodbridge, to, uh, with uh, transportation investment to uh, leverage that kind of growth. So in these small area plans, the goal is to be coming up with something that's a little bit different than the way we've done things in the past. This is something that's actually not just a Prince William County initiative, but it's actually a state initiative. Um, and the graphic here is just showing uh, some kind of concepts of when you think about places and place making, kind of two words that we throw out a lot in the planning industry. Um, and uh, the idea that there are places that are always going to stay rural and there's places that are going to be very urban. And there's a continuum and the term is a transect for all the places between urban and rural. And about four years ago, the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation recognized this need to be thinking more multimodally, not just about cars and trucks, but about people in transit of people walking and biking and moving all those different people and goods so you can accomplish things in a, in a more uh, dense environment. And the little graphic on the left, don't worry about the words, but just kind of visualizing the fact that there are this whole continuum of places and each new plan is seeking to find the type of place it wants to be. And with that comes the kinds of guidelines for how you design the roadways and transit systems and so forth to serve those places. And so kind of a lot of buzzwords, but this is something that is informing all of these new small area plans as Prince William County tries to come up with a, a more compact um, uh, means for future development over the next 20 years. 
Um, for the North Woodbridge plan, again, this is a, an area that has been recognized for uh, quite a long time as a place where there's a lot of potential. Um, so there were prior studies going back about a decade. There was a little thing called a recession that kind of put some of those on hold. Um, and the current initiative really started uh, during the calendar year of 2017, a series of stakeholder meetings, a community charrette, several community conversations and going into 2018, a lot of online and uh, in-person feedback, and uh, now where we are here kind of at the culmination of uh, some assistance from uh, ULI, the Technical Assistance Panel. And I'm curious, I'm a little new to the process, I'd like to see a show of hands, how many folks were involved in one of these processes over the past year and a half? So, so that's great. So we've got both a mix of people that have been in the room and a mix of new folks. So really, again, thanks to the folks who have already been working here, and we welcome the comments of folks who are joining us in the room. So uh, first kind of map here, again, I'm going to zoom in on this map, so don't fret too much about the details on this map. But there's two things I want to convey in this picture. Uh, the first is that the map does kind of show the area we're thinking of as North Woodbridge, and it does feature, you can recognize the Yakutuan River, the North Woodbridge Town Center, Belmont Bay and the golf course, and the commercial development down along Route 1 to Rumsco Plaza. And the basic message here is that there are some areas on gray there that we see as being ripe for either completion, like Belmont Bay has a plan that needs to, to be completed, um, a golf course where there's some questions about what the golf course will be, and places like North Woodbridge Town Center. Those are the places we're looking to incentivize change. The areas that are not colored gray are the places that are established residential communities, and we're looking to make sure those get preserved. Um, so it's a, a large area, but there are some real focal points to it. And on the right side there, you'll kind of see each of the small area plans has got a series of a vision and a series of goals. And the vision, uh, I will take the time just to read that because I know the print's small. Building on North Woodbridge's rich history, create a dynamic community to include a focus on creating a dense, mixed-use North Woodbridge town center while strengthening the existing communities of Moremsco and Belmont Bay, oriented around a multimodal transportation network, with a high quality of life on a vibrant waterfront. You'll see those words kind of going back, back again and again. And then there's uh, several uh, kind of key uh, goals that all of the details of the plan will, will orient towards those. I won't take the time during this presentation to read them, but happy to talk with you afterwards about them. Um, if we think about kind of this conceptual plan for the places we want change and the places we want to preserve, there's a few themes that emerge. Uh, the first is to have connected communities that have distinct characters, and again, the three that we're really focusing on is North Woodbridge Town Center, Belmont Bay, and Morusco. Another term you'll see and hear a lot tonight is the concept of a transit triangle. Many of you have heard this before already, uh, which is really anchored by the three red dots here around North Woodbridge Town Center. The VRE station, the potential fast ferry terminal we'll talk a lot about tonight, and the Omni Ride uh, commuter lot there at 995 and 123. Um, and then again, the idea of the vibrant waterfront all the way along the Occoquan and with kind of a focal point now anchored by the new GMU Science Center. Um, and one of the big uh, concepts here is the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. You know, this is a trail that is multi-state. It, it, it goes to Pennsylvania. Right now, uh, most of it on North Woodbridge is designated along Route 123, which is not your most friendly uh, place to have a Heritage National Scenic Trail. The goal is to take, get that trail and put it along the waterfront throughout uh, North Woodbridge. And then all of this is going to take some time. There's some things that we can do right away. There's some things that are going to take time to implement. And so there's uh, looking at how that gets phased in over time is really important. I mentioned before that idea of multimodal connectivity. So we've got to keep traffic moving. But we also have to make sure people will walk and bike safely. And we've got this transit triangle. We've got to make sure that it's connected internally and that uh, it helps you get to different places uh, in the county and in the region. And so that transit triangle, again, the services that are there already are really important. Over time, we'll be implementing bus rapid transit along Route 1. Fairfax County right now is actually in the process of going through all of the environmental documents to actually build the first part of that BRT from the Huntington Metro Rail Station to Fort Belvoir. And then the plans are to kind of, again, have that phase, keep on moving south as development comes online and help support that. From a pedestrian and bicycle <coughs> perspective, again, the, the, uh, the Heritage Trail kind of running along the waterfront. Uh, we'll talk on another slide about more crossings of Route 1 to get the, where you are now connected to the VRE station and to Belmont Bay. Um, and then a good street grid network, uh, particularly in the uh, North Woodbridge Town Center where that opportunity exists. 
And last but not least, the Route 1, 123 interchange is important, again, to move traffic, but also to help connect Belmont Bay, because that will be the way that uh, 123 will be able to connect directly to Belmont Bay Drive and not have to go around the VRE station to get past the VRE station. If we zoom in then and look at North Woodbridge Town Center, and that's where the rest of the presentations tonight will focus, the goal here is to create a dense place uh, with a lot of uh, development uh, that it would include mixed uses. So we want office, we want residential, we want retail and restaurants, and we want some civic cores, and we kind of identify these little green asterisks or little, uh, little stars as places to logically focus uh, civic places. And third spaces are often called the places that are either not where you work and, or where you live, but where you congregate for other reasons. Again, you'll see the transit-oriented development with those three uh, spines, ERE, fast <coughs> Omni-Ride, and then this pedestrian spine. If you can see in purple, the idea is that we do have this triangle. It's not going to be very easy to walk directly uh, along that triangle, but it's going to be easy to get from one place to the other because we're going to have a pedestrian spine that will be designed and laid out so that you will know where you are. It'll be uh, pedestrian-oriented, pedestrian emphasis in that Virginia uh, state document. Um, and then better pedestrian and bike crossings of Route 1. So where the trail will cross Route 1 and the rail tracks, the 123 interchange, again, that will get you connection across Route 1 to Belmont Bay Drive, a new bridge to get directly from the southern part of the town center to the VRE station, and better crossings <coughs> at the Dawson Creek. Um, just a couple of graphics here that kind of show that for those of you who've been involved in the study, there's been a lot of enthusiasm about uh, what could this place be. And so on the right side there is the idea that not only will there be a pedestrian spine, but there will be a circulator service that will connect those three elements of the transit triangle. So it could be a trolley kind of thing, you know, running on um, like an old town trolley in Alexandria, wide sidewalks. And then the idea that, uh, you know, as you look at it, better ways to cross Route 1, Maybe there's a way to kind of get a bridge for pedestrians and bikes to get over the top of Route 1 along the Occoquan. So looking for ways to kind of build excitement about uh, the potential for the Northwood Bridge. If we shift then down to Belmont Bay, uh, the goal here is to complete the master plan land development. The, a lot of Belmont Bay has been completed, but kind of the 100% corner of the town center still needs to, to be developed. So we'll look for ways to incentivize that. Again, aligning the Potomac <coughs> Heritage National Scenic Trail along the waterfront really building from both a design perspective and an economic perspective on the investment in George Mason University Science Center and the National Wildlife Refuge, a great resource here just to the south. So there's a way to hopefully bring people into that area uh, and help uh, create economic development in addition to uh, science and tourism. Uh, consider incorporating the golf course, uh, maybe into parks and open space. One of the things we're looking for feedback on is development potential as opposed to retaining parks and open space. Uh, really capitalizing on that vibrant waterfront. One thing that we just want to kind of have on the table is that this is, you hear a lot about fast ferry. This has been identified in the past as another location, as a potential fast ferry site. We don't see that as being the leading place uh, at this point, but it's been kind of on the, on the radar. And then again, the areas where there are existing residential communities kind of preserve those. One other thing just to mention here is that, you know, the, the industrial um, the properties on the west side of Dawson Creek Valor are not part of Belmont Bay, but yet they are a place that we do see as not a town center, but a place where there could be reinvestment and some changes in land use over time. And then the third kind of town center is Marumsco. Again, anchored by, but not limited to the property that's Marumsco Plaza, but again, really looking at taking the commercial properties that are those of a zone B1 and trying to get investment into them and encourage mixed use so that people could be living and working and shopping in those same places. Again, would they be a civic uh, node kind of in the center of the Marmsco Plaza? Improving pedestrian and bike connectivity. You know, if you go to the apartments back here, there's a lot of uh, what we call people's choice trails that uh, connect people or people are walking between the neighborhood and the, and the plaza. How can you make that a little bit more formal, a little bit more safe? Um, and then again, extending BRT along Route 1, ultimately. So when it comes to implementation, uh, this is again something that, is, is, as Rebecca said, it's a 20-year plan, it will take time to implement. So part of the plan will be an implementation section that talks about what do we do immediately, and one of the things we're doing immediately is working on how would you adjust zoning regulations to really encourage that kind of mixed use and the kinds of transportation systems that really facilitate the walking and biking in addition to moving people in cars. Uh, continuing the coordination with the stakeholders tonight, so uh, the start of the next set of steps. 
Um, and then uh, basically re regular reporting. Again, all the small area plans are going to have regular reporting back to the Board of County Supervisors on how are we doing. And that helps uh, you all have a say into how we're doing, and it helps uh, the board kind of figure out how to prioritize funding to keep all the plans moving forward. Um, and then attracting the economic development. So the goal is that in the town center, uh, uh, we, we want to have a uh, focusing on economic development, small businesses, office, um, implementation. Actually, I should have mentioned the, uh, I think uh, Supervisor Principi mentioned that many of you kind of drove through the construction, that implementation, even as we're doing a plan, that implementation is happening. Room one is getting uh, to be uh, safer and more attractive. Um, and then looking at all the different types of uh, businesses that could be uh, attracted to come here. Federal <laughs> folks, the folks in ICT businesses, the science and nature connections we mentioned, tourism related to that, and uh, industries like that. <coughs> so, next steps are working on this mixed-use zoning district that uh, will help the North Woodbridge plan, but will be applied countywide. The kind of level of service policy analysis and what level of service just means is that we're looking to make sure all the infrastructure, so not just transportation, but schools, fire and rescue, libraries, uh, that they will match and serve the folks that we're looking to have living, working, visiting the future North Woodbridge. Uh, refine this draft plan, so using your feedback. Uh, be a lot of also agency review, both within the county and with partner agencies such as uh, VDOT. Um, and then more public public meetings, and then ultimately the uh, formal process to go through the planning commission and the uh, board of planning supervisors. And uh, David McGettigan, who's uh, sitting right here, or standing right here, <laughs> is the uh, county's uh, lead for this uh, small area plan, and I'm happy to be uh, helping the county uh, in, in both uh, developing and helping present and get feedback on this plan. So that's it. I think we're going to turn the floor right over to Michael, if I first. To Deborah. Deborah. All right, I guess Frank is going to move over here. All right. Our next guest speaker uh, has volunteered his <coughs> time uh, and expertise as the chairman of the ULI, Urban Lane Institute Technical Assistance Panel. And he's been hard at work over the last couple of days meeting with landowners, business owners, the Fast Ferry Stakeholder Group, uh, and looking at maps and plans and talking with county staff uh, and he and his panel have come forward with a set of preliminary recommendations uh, that the county and uh, all of us will consider uh, to help us move forward. Uh, Michael Stevens is, uh, has a master's in uh, uh, urban planning and design uh, and uh, I just hope that um, we have half as much success in North Woodbridge that he has had up in D.C. planning the, we call it the uh, Capitol Riverfront. Now, if you know where the Capitol Riverfront uh, is, you know immediately what I'm talking about. It's where the Washington National Stadium is, the new Audi soccer uh, stadium, uh, the Anacostia River, the Anacostia Parks, uh, and uh, so uh, we feel very special to have Michael uh, with us to talk to us and be able to leverage what he's already accomplished as the president of the Business Improvement District in that area uh, and be able to bring those experiences uh, to uh, North Woodbridge. And with that, Michael, thank you very much for your right, time you so much. and your Sorry. expertise. It is our pleasure. And, uh, Frank, thank you for that warm welcome, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to wish all of you happy holidays, and thank you for coming out tonight on a pretty cold evening to hear what we have to say after spending literally a day and a half in your community. Um, we've been doing a lot of data dump, and um, Deb is Billick, who staffs the ULI uh, TAP technical assistance panel exercise is going to walk you through that. But I wanted to make a few opening remarks. First of all, I wanted to thank Frank and, and the county for uh, contracting with us to do this TAP panel. I've done seven of these panels in various areas in the region, and I think this is the most fun I've ever had and one of the best assignments because there's so much potential here. Um, secondly, I want to thank all the collaborating or organizations who've been working to bring Fast Ferry to the Occoquan here. And I think it's uh, it's something to build upon. I think the smaller area plan we've seen is something to build upon as well. And I want to thank Peggy, who's, Peggy, where are you? Raise your hand. She has been so instrumental in gathering information for us and coordinating, as has Megan. Uh, they've just been troopers 
uh, and providing us with the data dump. So this was one of the notebooks of all the studies and all the resources. And it really is a tome. So this is a lot of the information we've been ferreting through in a very short period of time. Um, I want to thank Deb Bielek for asking me to chair this panel. And I also want to thank my colleagues, eight professionals who are at the top of their game. And I think we worked very well together. I learned from the, these panels unbelievably. And I just had such a great time working with all of you. Thank you for your time, your professionalism, and your expertise. We are in an interesting period in the United States right now. And for the past 10 years, we've been going through rapid and accelerating urbanization. As population migrates from the middle of the country and immigrant patterns come to the east and the west coast, to the southwest, to Chicago, and along the Mississippi River, our cities are the places to be uh, for jobs creation, for culture, for living opportunities, work opportunities, the best that we have to offer as a country. So I think that's something to build upon, and Woodbridge, North Woodbridge, is going to be no different. You're going to rapidly urbanize. And I think the city has a hand in that. And I think you're fortunate, or the county has a hand in that. And I think you're fortunate that you have a supervisor who exhibits great vision, great political will, is willing to go through wonderful planning exercises and with an action agenda, and then have political capital and funding to back all of that up. Those are very key components to leverage private reinvestment, which is what you want. The other great factor, I think, is that cities are rediscovering their waterfronts. Those were long relegated to industrial shipping roles, often serving as open sewers throughout time, uh, used for shipping. Now they're coming back as real estate value, as places to gather and live, and they have enormous recreational value, tying us to park systems and recreational trails. You are no different here, and I think you have to leverage that in your community. Civilizations have always started with water. It's an essential of life and a foundation for settlements, for towns, for villages, for cities. And you're at the nexus of that here. So I think this is your moment in time to leverage this position on the Occoquan with fast ferry and the small area plan that's been done. I think Rebecca Horner and her team have done wonderful work, have set the foundation for us to build upon to bring you a successful ULI exercise. With that, I want to introduce Deb Billet to walk us through really the nuts and bolts of how all of this has unfolded. What to us seems like a very compressed day and a half, but it's actually a lot of preparation work to get us to this point. So Deb, turn it over to you, and then I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. I'll be great. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Deb Kirsten Billick. I'm the Senior Director with ULI Washington. And I want to say um, this is an excellent meeting, in part because we have excellent food and drink. So I just wanted to acknowledge how, um, how much that actually makes a difference, I think, in creating a great environment to learn about great things. So thank you for that. Um, so who are we? We've learned a lot about ULI. The Urban Land Institute is a mission and member-based organization. Our mission is to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating thriving communities around the world. We do that in a variety of ways. Um, but what I really want to acknowledge is the members of ULI who we're going to share with you their ideas today have all dedicated their time on a volunteer basis and their talent to share with you their ideas. So nobody was getting paid to be here today. Um, and I think what I also want to share is you really do have the best of the best of the industry in the room. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, we provide leadership in creating thriving communities in a variety of ways. Um, this technical assistance panel model is one of those ways. And so the idea is that um, a sponsor, in this case Supervisor Principi and his team, and Peggy and her team have approached ULI to say, hey, we have this intractable challenge um, and we're really interested in trying to figure out some recommendations. Can you help us? And so ULI will work with that sponsor for, in this case, a number of months to scope and refine the challenges, in this case around Fast Ferry, um, to create a series of, of questions that then a panel of experts can come in and talk about over the course of two days. So what you're hearing today is the culmination of many months of work, of scoping, creating briefing materials, and then two days on the ground learning and making recommendations. Um, we run our technical assistance panels all over the region. There have been um, at least over 20 in the past five years. We've been all over the place. And after tonight, Woodbridge will have a dot on this map as well. Um, they're intended to be customized. So if you're attracted to what you hear tonight and you want to talk to me about other opportunities, please let me know. These are our panelists. We spent, like I said, the past two days 
really on the ground thinking through fast ferry service here in Woodbridge. Um, and that included meeting with many of you. That included a tour of this marina and also a tour of the Transit Triangle. Um, and it included meeting and hearing from the variety of sponsors on their background um, and the other variety of studies, as you've seen, that have been done on this project. So what I'd love to do, everybody will speak tonight, but maybe starting with Matt, would you mind just standing and telling us who you are and the expertise you bring to this team? Sure, good evening everyone. My name is Matt Stainhawk. I work for PN Hoffman. We are a mixed-use developer, uh, primarily located in Washington, D.C., but doing work uh, sort of all around the region and outside of there as well. Uh, most well-known probably for the District Wharf, if anyone has uh, been up there in Southwest D.C. <coughs> Hi, I'm Julia Koster. I'm with the National Capital Planning Commission. That is the federal government's uh, body to review all federal development in the region. I serve as the commission secretary, and I oversee all of their public engagement activities as well. Uh, good evening. My name is Stan Wall. I'm with HRNA Advisors. We're a real estate development and economic development advisory firm um, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're mm -hmm. lead lots of efforts on urban revitalization, affordable housing, um, public realm improvement and funding strategies for the types of projects. Um, immediately before coming to HRNA, I was at WMATA, where I was head of TOD and stationary high end development program. Hi, my name is Al Cox. I'm the city architect and historic preservation manager for Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, you may have known about the waterfront master plan that we finished recently, where we spent three years with the public process to redesign and connect the chain of parks up and down our waterfront on the Potomac. My name's Stan Reed. <coughs> I'm an urban planner uh, with Tool Design Group. I do a lot of active transportation. That's walking, biking, and transit. And I also do writing. I'll be writing the report for this uh, for our recommendations when we're done. Uh, good evening. I'm Serena Eitler, and I'm a strategic planning advisor with Stantec Consulting Services. But prior to that, I served 20 years with the Department of Defense in the Office of Economic Adjustment. I worked with the Prince William community. Northern Virginia, National Capital Region on a lot of the BRAC actions from 2005 and have worked with a lot of communities across the country um, for 20 years, helping them through the economic transition of a major defense action. Good evening. My name is Michael Winstanley. I'm the founder of Winstanley Architects and Planners in Old Town Alexandria. Uh, our office was the author of the uh, Potomac River Framework Plan that really looked at blocking out water transportation throughout the entire region. And it is, I, th I believe, on the website, uh, the Fast Ferry website. <coughs> uh, and I'm Ryan Bauma. I'm a landscape architect and urban designer with AECOM. I'm very happy to be back. I helped out with the workshops back in January in North Woodbridge. Uh, I plan and design uh, waterfront communities and transit-oriented development communities um, and the streetscapes and the parks that make them great. And again, Michael Stevens, I'm the president of the Capital Riverfront Bid. I've been doing urban planning, city planning, and economic development, and historic preservation for over 40 years, mostly in urban environments and for the public sector as well as the private sector. Thank you all. So I think what I really want to drive home is that there's some incredible talent that went into the thinking behind these recommendations, folks who have experience in waterfront development from all across the region. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for your commitment. Um, and from here, I'd like to hand it to Michael. Right. Just Take us through what we're going to learn today. So we were given a series of eight questions, which served as our scope of services and helped frame our thinking. But I want to couch it this way. How many of you, instead of reading the full book in English literature, consulted Cliff Notes? <laughs> well, you're going to get a Cliff Notes version of all of our work for today, and that's going to lead to a longer report that we'll produce with a lot more background to it, a lot more narrative, and a lot more illustrations. But tonight, we're going to take you through the process we went through. We've done a lot of listening and talking to people, so we want to talk about what we've heard, introduce you to the framework plan, talk about who's involved in implementing it and seeing it through completion, talk about phasing, early, mid-range, and long-term phasing, and how is that funded, and then leave you with some big ideas and some big inspirations that we think will keep you energized over the life of this project. <coughs> I like this quote, high-speed ferries take pressure off other forms of transit, serve transit des deserts like older waterfront industrial zones, like my Capital Riverfront neighborhood, and complement on-land transit systems. 
it's a sexy trip. The commute by boat can be a winding down time. So I think we all have a romantic notion of water. We certainly don't have a romantic notion of sitting in a car for 90 minutes on 95 or Route 1 going north or south. I can't go to Richmond anymore because I can't do the drive. But I think this is a way, a transportation modality, which is coming back into favor. And it does have its appeal beyond the pure functionality because it leads to land-based investment, but a great trip on a dreary day is even pretty from a boat. So what if we heard? Well, we heard we, you want a ferry. And it's backed up by 13 studies and numerous years of thinking about this. Organizational meetings from the state to the federal to the local to the county level. Numerous agencies involved and numerous stakeholders. That you need multimodal options to serve a growing community, community that's going to accelerate over time. Especially if there's some of the public investment is put in place that we recommend will leverage private reinvestment. Your area is transit rich, but I think we need to wean people gradually from Route 1 and, and I-95 corridors to bus, to carpooling, to ride sharing, to uh, river taxi, fast river service. Aquaquan Marina is the appropriate place for this to happen. I think that's generally the consensus we heard, and we tend to agree with that because it's really the main point of intervention for us to do public planning and, and private investment and public investment. <coughs> And we engage, there are a lot of engaged stakeholders for this. I commend you. The turnout tonight is impressive. I think it represents residents, businesses, organizations, and all of you have a vested interest in this happening and being successful and seeing a community grow and thrive. But there are impediments. We heard from Willem Pollock that the river is not just putting a boat on it and drying up, that there are things out there, uh, negotiations that have to occur with federal agencies or federal, federal military installations, ice and debris can thwart your travel there and it does take some land-based investment there are environmental concerns of waves uh, if you go too fast and how do you get around that and keep the timing of the ferry up lots of parties there are lots of people controlling these various impediments which we like to also view as opportunities those are future partners that can help us make this a success and someone described this it's like we've been doing a dance for a really long time and we think it's now time for you to start dating and maybe make some promises to one another that we're going to do this. You know, you either get divorced or you, you, you separate or you move on. So I think we, we want you to date and get married and really implement this. It's going to take substantial investment to launch. It's not only purchasing boats, there's some land-based uh, investments of a new dock and we want to talk at length about that and the logistics of it. Uh, but it also is coordinating on the opposite ends too. And we think this development and the start of it can spur new multifamily development beginning at the river's edge and going up the hill all the way to the new town center. And we think this is a marvelous opportunity. But then we asked our question, is the tail wagging the dog? Are we becoming obsessed with fast ferry as the magic solution, as the only solution, as the only option to doing the things that you want to do through the small area plan? And so we wanted to expand our thinking in this exercise and go beyond the idea of the ferry and the functionality of that and using the river. And transit is not the only engine that's going to drive redevelopment in this area. It is certainly a contributing factor, but it is one of many and it's a complicated and time consuming and long exercise that takes that political will, that vision, that planning, that public funding and private response. It would be an efficient system in one way and that it brings people back and forth between a destination up north and back here to Aquaquan Ferry. But then there's this big gap in the middle when the ferries are somewhat sitting idle and they're not being put to productive use. So we wanted to expand that to, to make Aquaquan here, or not Aquaquan, North Woodbridge, a true destination where people might want to take the ferries in the middle of the day down here to take advantage of what you're building and developing and creating as a community, a sense of place with a new identity. So we want to talk about here and destination and how you make that as part of this community building exercise. We envision that you can have success with fast fare and so we want you to do this. And I, we want you to look at those impediments. Willem has been an incredible asset to us, as has Frank. But we want you to get off the dime and do this. We want to cre help you create a successful town center. I think this small area plan really was foundational, very visionary, 
and spoke the right language for us to draft behind. You really did create an opportunity for us to think beyond. We want a destination experience and community that grows the economy, uh, creates the opportunity for mixed use, just like the small area plan says, adds residents to here and enhances the market, diversifies your economy, adds some employment opportunities and some office space. We think that new open space and connecting a, a series of civic investments or a civic armature back to the river is one of the key things in early public investments that you can do. And it's going to create this framework of which you can grow a community. And finally, we think that this uh, fast ferry and knitting together the transportation triangle really starts to solve larger transportation issues of connectivity. We drove it all around, we see there are gaps, and there needs to be a lot of coordination, not only amongst your community, but other agents and agencies and other operators to make this a true success. I, I, I think Serena, who, who works for Stantec, had looked at what are some of the principles that may lead to a successful ferry operation. So I'm going to turn it over to her, and you're going to be hearing from everybody on the team because you don't want to hear me talk the whole time, you don't want to hear them talk the whole time. So, Serena, come on up and walk us through this, please. Thank you, thank you. Before the rest of the group gets uh, engaged in kind of giving you the big picture <coughs> overview of our proposed redevelopment strategy, I wanted to highlight uh, some principles that we thought were important to integrate into the redevelopment strategy to also support the fast ferry and transit services in this part of Prince William. And by the way, I forgot to mention, I'm a resident of Prince William. I've lived here for 26 years, and I've commuted north on 95 and 395 for 26 years. So I think I understand a few of the issues. Um, uh, there's three things that we need to highlight. Uh, passenger experience in, in putting, pulling together the different transit modes in this area. Um, making sure that the passenger understands what the trip journey is going to be. Uh, a seamless fare payment process like the uh, Smart Trip Pass, WMATA, uh, the PRTC buses that I rode for a number of years. It was really helpful rather than bringing those gold coins in my pocketbook. Uh, I finally got that card that I could use um, on the PRTC system as well as a subway system or whatever I connected with in Fairfax or uh, the DC area. Um, also trying to promote a seamless uh, transportation network among the different transit modes. Uh, the operations of the, of the system, aligning the different networks. We have the bus system, we have VRE, and then this proposed fast ferry system. Uh, making sure that the systems talk to one another, if there is delays or a disruption in service, if you're on the bus, how do you know about that if you're trying to transfer over to VRE or to a fast ferry service? And then also very important is being able to integrate into the redevelopment strategy of uh, connectivity of these transit services through the infrastructure that's put in place. Making sure that there's physical links between the different transit modes that help support that seamless transfer for the passenger so they have a positive experience. Uh, plan mobility hubs, which we've incorporated into this development strategy that will be discussed in more detail. And then also assuring that there's adequate facilities for a very important piece, pedestrian uh, service um, and access. Uh, I think one of the uh, guidelines for the North Woodbridge uh, sector plan or small study area uh, is smart development, smart growth, uh, putting emphasis on pedestrian access, a five or ten minute walk to these transit services to get us out of our cars. Uh, making sure that there's facilities for uh, bicycles, scooters, uh, shared rides, uh, pick up and drop off points, and layover. And I think that is going to provide the development framework. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that we did, they mentioned, we, we drove around a bit, we got to, got to see uh, a lot of the, the contacts and some of the surrounding communities, and that was, that was very helpful. But one of the things we like to do when we start to look at any of these, these sites is, is, you know, pull up a little bit, use, use the magic of Google Maps, and try to put some things at scale into some context that we can recognize. So 
Um, the community closest down to the water, which we're going to call the riverfront um, node of the, the parcel, it's, it's about a quarter mile on uh, either dimension across the way, which will be give or take a five minute walk. Very walkable, very manageable scale of a, of a space. Um, we'll get into this more as we go, so some of these slides are in a, a bit of a funny order. Um, but we're recommending actually that the high speed ferry dock be at the end of Marina Way. And because that Marina Way is a spine, it's going to connect all the three communities together. And, and really, that's you want that to be a celebrated moment. We want that to be the thing that's bringing you down here. So we thought that was a more uh, appropriate location. Uh, and there's a conversation to be had with the team from Vulcan about some of the underused uh, areas on their site that's currently um, greenery and um, some, some trees that, that could be a nice parking node there. And it's a very short walk, two, three minutes down. So from there, we pull back a little bit farther and try to think about how these three areas can connect. You see a five minute walk gets you to the riverfront. That is the area between the water and Annapolis Way. Uh, the next zone that we'll go through, uh, we are calling the Midlands, which is between Annapolis Way and uh, 123. And then you have the town center, which is 123 out to Occoquan Road. Um, and those are all about five minute increments of walking along this straight path, which would bring you all the way down. Very manageable. Now, there's a bit of topography. We acknowledge that. Um, and if you're all the way out at the town center, uh, perhaps you know, you'd like a bicycle. It's a five minute ride, very quick and easy. Um, but that, that helped us kind of scale the world around us and, and put it in terms of things that we uh, have familiarity with. So we looked at these first two communities in that uh, 10 to 15 minute walk half mile, edge to edge again, it's all right. So how can we relate this to places we've been, places we've seen that we think are great models uh, for development and that fit into a lot of what uh, we saw as a result of the charrette process that, that everyone in here has uh, undertaken and as the, the you know, 13 years of studies that, that led up to it. So we said, all right, let's take this and think about it in Pike and Rose, which is a, a redevelopment area in White Flint, uh, North Rockville area of Maryland. And you can kind of start to see how the scale of that parcel can work at a, a larger, uh, more urban framework. Then we looked at uh, the Wharf project near and dear to my heart, which I could kind of get my head around how it can work. This is a very nice walk edge to edge. Done it more times than I can count. And it's, it's very manageable and it's, it's a very nice scale. It's about a 49 acre uh, area that we have drawn there. And the perfect one is actually with um, in Michael's community in the Capitol Riverfront. This is the yards area going from the ballpark to the Navy Yard from M Street to the water. Happened to be basically a, a you know, spot on analog for the site that we're going to talk through or two of the three sites that we're going to talk through today. So that was something that we did just to kind of get our head around what we're dealing with here. What are the What's the potential for it? Now there's obviously a thousand differences on all these things, but it's it's a tool that we found useful. And here's where we landed. I know um, we had those pinned up over there, so a lot of you have probably already taken a little bit of an opportunity to look at it. Um, it builds off of what we uh, saw in the draft small area plan uh, and that we saw in the various studies. Those three communities, again, the riverfront, which is about a 30-acre parcel, then moving halfway out of the Midlands, 72 acres, and the town center, uh, coming all the way out there, which is another 42 acres. So about 150 acres, all said, uh, in those three pieces. And we tried to design around the, the density recommendations that were uh, being proposed uh, through the small area plans. Uh, and that's a whole lot of numbers that is not really going to read very well on this screen, other than to say the FAR of around three was what we had understood the target to kind of be. And we felt it was supportable. So now we're going to go place by place down, starting at the town center and working our way back to the water. Thank you. Thank you Max. I'm going to back up a second here. Um, one of the things in our framework plans you can see here is that the ferry is located right here. 
And one of the, we believe, a really important component to this is this spine. It starts with Marina Way. We believe that this spine should actually come up and connect all the way through these neighborhoods here and really be the main avenue that takes us all the way down here. And, and remember, um, as Matt had shown, it's a 15 minute walk from this location down to this location. We're showing you that because the whole point of increasing the density is to say that there's more opportunity for people to ride the ferry. That the density, you shouldn't be afraid of the density, that there's going to be too much traffic. We have four modes of transportation to get these people out of this area, out of the area. So, and one of them happens to be the ferry, the one that we're focused on. So I'm going to take you through the densest of, of these three neighborhoods, which is the town center area here. And so you can see that these are more detailed plans. We sat down and we used scales and we figured out how big buildings should be and how the roads should be and we really calculated a lot. You can see that this is the area here which is about a 30 acre parcel. Uh, this is Route 1 running along here. Here's the uh, VRE located here. Here's the uh, commuter lot and then here's the ferry down here. And I'm going to show you a blow up of this right here. So in this particular parcel, you can see that this is the most mixed use of all the parcels, meaning that it has office, it has uh, residential, of different types of residential in this parcel, it has retail, and it also has open space and what we're calling reserves for cultural or civic uses. And those cultural civic uses are things like schools, we put this much residential here, we're gonna to wanna to have some sites for schools. You may want a library, you may want a fire station. So we're really trying to think of how this framework can work and that we can reserve sites for programs that can come along later. So you can see um, mixed use site with the highest density. It's also the gateway site from the VRE. Right now there is that pedestrian connection from the VRE here. What we're saying is let's carry it across uh, Route 1 to this area. And then we've located all the commercial office buildings along Route 1. These are the highest buildings, probably uh, six stories, maybe structured parking above. They could be as high as 80 feet, uh, 80 or 90 feet. But they're located along Route 1. Um, as you get into the area here, you can see that, that as we go forward or kind of uh, north here, the, the, the densities go down to the end over here where we have a series of townhouse units. And in between here, we have um, what we refer to uh, as a structured parking in the middle and housing around it. It's a, it's a product type that is uh, uh, affordable uh, before you uh, uh, get to complete structured parking. And, and we even have a, a very tall, um, or a very tall, let's say a six or to eight story residential structure that may have parking below grade. And these sites are maybe uh, sites that are developed uh, years to come, but we wanted to provide that kind of density. And equally important in this whole thing here is that we put a reserve right in the middle of this of about two acres, a two acre town square. And the town square is programmable. This is a place that you have art fairs. This is a place you have farmer's markets. This is a place that in the wintertime you have a skating rink. And it's a place that you it, that you can all go and and and, and gather. Uh, you can see art fairs, festivals. Um, I've gone through this now. The other part here is that this is Marina Way, and we showed you before that this is the main drag all the way down to the water here. And it 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 will you'll see in a series of plans that Marina Way starts all the way here at Aquacon Road. It has a cultural use along it, and there'll be other cultural uses as we get down through this whole area. And I'll take it, and, and Al or, or Dan will talk about the next neighborhood. <coughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, what we're gonna talk about next is the Midlands. Um, English reference. It just was because it was in the middle, and that's, uh, that's <laughs> what we so we, we only had a day to do this. <laughs> we didn't do it for Yeah, that's true. Um, so what we're doing here is really just continuing what Michael just talked about. The architecture is the same kind of apartment building, typically um, all residential in this Midland section. Um, grades in height from Route 1 on this side down to a townhouse. Um, area that gets back towards some of the wetlands and some of the uh, open space in the back. But most importantly, it continues the spine on down to the, the new pier down here for the fast ferry, 
we have also a node on the way down because as you're walking you like to see some open space these are going to be buildings that are four to six stories in height along this main street uh, that's going down to the river the spine of the community and so it will draw you looking down at this open space maybe there's a sculpture maybe there's outdoor dining coffee shops a group a playground, a playground that can be in this space and we too are showing a civic space there that could uh, in Alexandria Potomac Yards for instance we have a fire station on the ground floor with workforce housing up above and that was something that we worked out with the developer and the community um, and that's the kind of thing that once you start achieving this kind of density you may want here as well um, so the main thing is the spine with some retail opportunities along the spine so that as you're walking along the CVS the neighborhood service kind of retail that keeps these people from having to go get in their car and drive to a strip shopping center somewhere along 123. Ah, sorry. Yeah. There you go. I just wanted to just wanted to add on to that that you know one of the crucial things about having this little open space here is that we're on a slightly higher elevation than the riverfront area and the pier, so you'll still be able to take advantage of the views of the water and the access up here the people living here people coming here to shop or to enjoy this uh, green space here uh, the most exciting part about this neighborhood for me is uh, right now Prince William County has a couple of local bus routes that generally end in this area one along 123 one along route 1 and they all right now converge around the Woodbridge VRV station Fairfax County has been working on their VR bus rapid transit that's sort of a, a faster bus with farther apart stops sort of like a train with rubber tires coming <coughs> down route 1 that would also terminate in Woodbridge. And so there's a real opportunity to bring those things together right here in, in the Midlands with a sort of bus transit center that both makes it easier to transfer between those different services to connect to the ferry and the VRE train, but also can be an anchor for this community. The people who live here can actually walk to the service, and that means they're not parking in the park and ride lot, they're not clogging up Route 1 trying to get to the service, but they're already here. Um, Am I missing anything? No, sure. No? All right. <coughs> I'm going to hand it over to Ryan, who will talk about the riverfront. Okay. You know we're going through this quickly, but uh, we can always talk about it uh, afterwards if you have any questions. I, the, you know, the riverfront is why we're all here in a way, right? I mean, it's the, it's the, the magic of the place. When we had those workshops back in January, everybody talked about how critical uh, the river was to why they live nearby, uh, the kind of the identity of the place. Uh, and as everybody's just been talking about with the, the amount of, of new community possible at the top of the hill, uh, we need to realize that, that as we move down Marina Way, that all of that development, its relationship to the water, is focused down on a relatively precious and relatively small amount of waterfront, now, roughly 500 feet or so from, the, from where we are here uh, down to where the restaurant is, to the edge of the Vul Vulcan property. Um, and so, you know, our experience from working in Old Town Alexandria and in Washington, D.C.'s emerging waterfronts, uh, tell us a few key lessons about what does make for a successful waterfront and how do you get people 15 minutes inland to still identify as a waterfront neighborhood. A couple key things need to happen in, in order for that uh, to work. Um, Number one, we do believe that there needs to be public access at the end of Marina Way. That where this, this ferry terminal is needs to be a place where the public can be all of the time. And that is a transformation from a, a privately held piece of property, but we'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. Uh, number two, so you do need to have that access, public access at the water's edge, a place for people, and then you need to be able to move along that water's edge. Uh, one, one key idea is that the city of Alexandria is finally finding its public open space at the end of King Street after a couple hundred years of want. Uh, and, and they, they had to put it on plans for a long time before it was actually possible. Uh, and another key idea is the way people come and go to it, it can't be a cul-de-sac. Right now, where we are right now is the end of a long street. So part of our thought is that you need to be able to come back up the hill on the northern side of Rivergate and connect back into the community uh, that Al and Dan were just talking about. The, other, the thought about how the, 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 tr the waterfront trail works is you know, how you make those things work is really interesting. 
Another lesson from both the Capitol Riverfront and Alexandria is you can get that trail to happen in a temporary way for even a decade and then move it to the optimal location uh, when, uh, the, when the time is right. And so part of our thinking is as you come in from Aquapon, and you work either, even if you're working along the street next to the private residences, you come under 95 and across the wetlands, you want to come along a promenade along the water's edge with the boats on your left and new development on your right to that focal point and then be able to keep going. And we understand that Vulcan's uh, operations are really critical right here at the edge, but there's no reason why we couldn't come uphill just slightly and then maybe work out an easement with them across land that they're not actually using. They actually convey their, uh, their aggregate up and over that location and tie into under, at grade roads that bring you right into Belmont Bay. So that may be a possibility. And of course it takes a, a, a partnership with Vulcan to make it happen. But just like in Alexandria, you've got to put that line on the map in order to register that you want it to happen, even if it's not immediately feasible. Uh, the other idea, though, is that that stream valley that's right out the windows over here, we think that's actually a really great amenity. and that It needs to be looked at as not necessarily the back door of something, but uh, another front door to this waterfront. Zooming in just a little bit. This is our idea for the kinds of space that might be appropriate at the foot of Marina Way. <coughs> so a place where when you come down to the end of the street, you have a pro that promenade starts and it takes you right out onto a substantial pier. A pier that you could go out onto at any time, not only if you're waiting for the ferry boat. The ferry boat would be able to, or all three of them would be able to dock around it if necessary. And there would be places for people, you know, a, a pavilion of sorts where you could get refreshments, get your tickets, wait in a conditioned space for the ferry boat. Uh, you know, or it could sell tickets for the performance that's happening next door, possibly. Uh, the idea here then is that you would have a, a public space, roughly an acre or so, that is both a plaza in some ways and a, a park-like green area and others. But the kind of place where your kids can run around after dinner. Uh, play in the fountain right next to the water, or turn that fountain off and have a performance of some kind. Flank that with retail, new retail space, with residential above it. And the idea here is that, that you would have a building that could be built in that similar form to what Rivergate is built as here. Maybe it's six stories or so in height with the parking garage wrapped on all sides. With the activated use at the ground floor and the promenade that takes you along the waterfront past the boats and connects you into the riverfront trail system. The next idea that we're showing here, this is, that, that's drawn right over the top of the building we're in right now. And the idea is to enhance and over time maybe even increase the kind of activities that we're having here right now at this site. Perhaps a, a, a modest conference center of sorts, event venues, weddings, all the kinds of things that we're talking about before and even the possibility for hotel and lodging on this site too should be considered. There's great visibility from here to all those cars coming down 95, looking down into this, <laughs> this great waterfront. Uh, the, uh, and then of course, turning the corner and heading back up. Uh, when we, we were asked to think about how the fast ferry needs to integrate with this larger vision, and there are considerations when you have a ferry system. There's things that you have to put fuel in the boats, and we haven't exactly located where all the, those pieces of infrastructure would be, but that's another reason to have a loop road, and another reason to have the kind of promenade feature where you, you have the ability to have fuel trucks and things like that do what they need to do and connect to these boats here at this uh, hub location. The other thing you need to think about is parking, and there have been discussions about how the commuter lot might fit in and whether a shuttle bus is necessary. We get kind of concerned that the more seats you have to sit in to get to work. Um, the people's uh, the viability of the transit system suffers a lot when we ask people to transfer multiple times. So the goal would be to get the parking facilities as close to their seat on the boat as possible. That is a little bit of a challenge again when you think about how tight we are here for land. So there's a couple considerations. Number one, start with what we have. There's almost 200 spaces right out here um, by the restaurant space. So you can start by using those spaces uh, for commuting. The next thought is to think about those creative partnerships with Vulcan. They guess they've said they're not moving, but there's, there's, but there's things to consider. That space in the middle that Matt mentioned, it's where the hill is and the green areas, they don't use that right now. Maybe they'd actually like someone to pay them to, to build parking in that space, and they could still convey their aggregate between the, the parking facilities. 
There's other thoughts about maybe it would actually work better to have surface lots closer to the water on their property in the interim. We could think about those ideas too. One thing that we've laid out in this building is the ability to put in more parking than is necessary so that it could either serve the event venue or the ferry boat as well. And there's other ideas about working with IDI who's built this building and is building phase two to think about creative partnerships with the parking their building. And maybe they don't need all of the parking their building, maybe there's management related um, partnerships that could be created to provide that, um, uh, that access. In the worst case, there could be more parking at the top of the hill. It's a little farther away. Uh, by metro standards, that parking's not too far away, but we really want to push to get as much of that parking as close to the ferry as possible. So one of the things we really want to stress when it comes to thinking about this waterfront, and of course this 500 feet right here, is to not be too, um, you know, it's, it is very important and to not think of it as where can we tuck a dock in here or where can we place a boat around the corner there. We probably need to think about this as uh, more of a public works project, but over time a significant redevelopment project to get it right and to have the kind of waterfront that the rest of Northwood Bridge needs to access. But it's also important to, if you have a big vision like that to have practical steps to get there. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Julia to talk about those steps. Thank you. Actually, this is Okay, I'll take a step over here. There we go. Okay, uh, from my uh, 20 years experience working across the country with defense communities, um, there's a couple of, uh, I guess, perspectives that I'd like to share with you that might be applicable to this project. Um, you have an existing stakeholder group uh, that I think Peggy or NVRC convened, what, four or five years ago? Um, and you've been working together. It's a, a, a regional organization. It involves a federal, state, local government officials, also a private business interests. Um, that's good. That That's the right group to get together to try to uh, work those partnerships out. But as this project evolves and, it, and you start getting into the uh, infrastructure improvements, the, the fast ferry service is up and operating, um, it's a recommendation that you might want to consider transitioning into a single coordinating task force or even sooner. Um, and that's what we've done across the country with defense communities. Um, we end up uh, creating a, a single entity that everybody knows if you have questions where you need to interface with someone, this is a group that you go to because there's multiple multiple parties that will be involved in this. Again, you'll want to include local, state, federal, and private sector representatives, uh, but you want people that are in senior positions within those organizations and uh, decision makers. And you'll want to pull together <coughs> the parties that have programs or resources that are going to support your effort and most importantly, have the financial resources to help them. Um, I also understand that uh, there's interest in using uh, or transitioning this existing stakeholder group into a more formal entity that might oversee the day-to-day -day ferry operations. That's something that we would recommend. Um, then at some point in time, you may want to consider creating a, a business improvement district or something to the effect of whatever you want to call it here in Prince William. Um, similar to what is used up in Arlington County for the Crystal City area, Roslyn, Boston area. Um, in the Washington DC area, I understand there's 11 business improvement districts that have been established across the area. And this allows um, an interface with the property owners and the business owners, uh, possible uh, um, assessment, some kind of revenue stream that can be uh, created to help continue to build out the project. And then we also recommend that the county consider assigning a full-time dedicated staff person uh, that would focus only on this redevelopment project, the interface supporting the fast ferry operations. Um, this staff person could also support this single coordinating task force that is pulled together. Thank you, Samina. And I think now uh, 
Oh, I did get a, I was going to say, now you will not get any more pretty pictures for a while. <laughs> because I'm, I'm here, but there is one, so thank you, Deb. But we're here to talk a little bit about the phasing of this project. So what I want you to think about are what are the things you need to do right now in the next couple of years? What are the things to plan for in the next five to ten years, uh, maybe 15? And what are some really long-term considerations? So um, let's just kind of recap a little bit of where we've been. Uh, where we are with the panel's recommendations is really to help you think about the redevelopment of a much larger area than just the ferry pier. So we're really saying think about that whole area with the ferry as a component. Um, we also, I think Michael, everyone on the panel has emphasized that this uh, area that we've been looking at has so much potential and so many opportunities and one of those is in fact that you have multiple transit options and multiple transportation modes. So for the folks that you will be bringing here, whether they're working or living here, it's this enormous opportunity to have access to all of those different ways to move around. And the transit triangle, this redevelopment area we're talking about, it's a great gateway opportunity for you. This kind of signals, hey, you have arrived in Prince William County. Um, it helps connect this whole community to the water. Again, we're going to talk about rethinking your transportation connections so that they work together as a system. And again, to give people multiple options. And we really want to create more of a destination uh, that exemplifies North Woodbridge, its identity, its place, uh, and makes it feel like a community and a place for everyone to gather. So I think the first message is that in order to start the dance, actually, since Michael said this, the first date, we think the public sector actually has to do the asking a little bit. <laughs> uh, and that's hard, but <laughs> part of it is, part of it is that we really think that the <coughs> civic infrastructure, so all of the things we've talked about in terms of the, the parks, the civic spaces and places, the road networks, some of those are things that you all need to figure out how to create as a signal to say, we're ready for investment. Come on over here. We have a game plan. We have a vision. So here's some things to think about in the early phase. And part of this, um, I think we've said it's really important to kind of show your intentions. So get it into your plans. Um, and it's really tremendous that you're already, you're already in that process. You're on your way there. So um, start planning for the multimodal transit center that we were thinking about that helps bring the system together and takes advantage of what's going to be coming down the line, uh, literally, for bus rapid transit and other transportation forms. Um, identify and move on key public land acquisitions. We talked about some of the parks, some of the areas where you might think about locating a school or a library. Um, and I think what's important there is that right now, this is the moment when you want to actually acquire those before development momentum starts. What you don't want to have happen is say, uh-oh, we need this, and land value has already started to really go up. Um, get these things into your capital improvement plan and start adopting some really important things into your overall plans. And uh, We've already heard this, but the street grid concept that you're working on for this small area plan, the continuous shoreline access um, between Belmont Bay all the way up to Old Occoquan, and any necessary zoning changes. So make that mark. Um, I think the other thing for that initial first phase, we really did focus on the ferry and that riverfront component. So we've talked about making the move of locating the ferry dock along at the end of Marina Way. Um, and um, we also wanted to make sure that the ferry dock, again, was a public dock, more than just, just a kind of a slip going out. And that's one of those civic investments that you can make. Um, it really starts to create that sense of place 
and destination for that whole neighborhood we've been talking about. So um, the interim parking for the ferry, Ryan went through those <coughs> options. Um, and then one of the things is, and I think Michael really emphasized this, is you're ready to kind of start running that ferry and you've got ideas through all those studies for some very specific lines that sort of uh, align to Joint Base Anacostia Bowling, perhaps a line uh, that went to MGM that takes advantage of knowing their employees in this region that could be there. And that helps you figure out how the ferry system is going to work. So in, in the next couple of years, you can start running the ferry system, see how it works, see how it works at this location. Um, one of the things I do want to say is we agree that um, this is probably the best site for a ferry, but we did hear that there might be other different options uh, <coughs> that might be better for time, you know, gets you a little closer. Um, what we think is great about the ideas we're offering here is even if the ferry moved to another location at some point in the future, you still have this great riverfront area that helps anchor this whole redevelopment strategy. Does that make sense? I'm okay, yeah, yes. whoa. So that's, that, I think that's a really important thing, is that, is that when you make these investments, they will help the ferry system, but they're gonna help build <coughs> this new community for you, regardless. So it's kind of a win-win. Um, uh, we talked about getting those early investments in civic and urban park spaces at the ferry dock edge. Uh, possibly even thinking about small boat launches at the far end if you want to put in a kayak. Want to keep them away from the ferry a little bit. Um, and to maybe even start simple, uh, we've heard that there are already some bus shuttle systems that River, uh, Riversgate will be doing uh, in the near future. Maybe you can have a more connected system that helps get things started in the short term. Um, and then we'll think a little bit longer. What happens in five to 15 years? So by that time, uh, hopefully you will have an organization like a business improvement district that can help you with things uh, ranging from marketing, branding, working with developers uh, to really help advance this idea. And, and a bid can do everything from programming activation so it's really um, an entity that gives you a, a focal point um, and there are great examples in this region um, they're, they're pretty amazing um, we also think that that might be the point again where you start building the transit hub uh, really building out that street grid network um, and creating parcels and building what we call a series of experiences. So again, you're walking down Marina and you're hitting a park uh, every five minutes. So it's kind of a, a very neat, very special um, experience for this area. Um, this is when you might be able to make some of your other civic investments to look at <coughs> schools and libraries that you may want to build there. Um, and we think it's important that as you start the ferry service, that you're constantly looking at what the opportunities are to add on and expand, um, because you'll continue to find that if there's a larger ferry system network up and down the Potomac, it gives you more opportunities to add to that. Uh, long term, um, we are really, really hoping that you find a way to have continuous waterfront access um, along that entire stretch. We know that you have to figure out how to hop over oh, a few railways and around some highways. Uh, but there are great, again, there are great examples in this region of how people have built trails along riverfront edges. Um, and we hope that you take advantage of seeing what else is out there and bringing it here. Um, we also know that there are big plans for a 123 interchange. We looked at them and we said, maybe one of the things you want to do is once this area plan is, is kind of uh, nearing <coughs> completion, is to make sure you understand how this particular transportation investment serves the vision 
that you have for this new area. So we weren't sure kind of how that all fit in, so we encourage you to take a, take a look at that. Um, and I think as Ryan noted, um, the Vulcan site is there, it's operational, they have long-term <coughs> plans, but it's really important for you as a community to continue to work with them and be ready if there is an opportunity to figure out how this site could be integrated into really longer term future development. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Stan. Uh, thank you to Julia. Uh, <coughs> while most of the team was, was drawing the great plans and sketches <laughs> and area plans and really cool graphics, uh, Julia and I were working very close together to figure out how do you actually get this done. So she walked you through the phasing plan um, from the you know, immediate activities, midterm and long-term activities, and I was working on how do we pay for it? And at each of these different stages, where does the money come from? And what do you need, and how do you start small to create that initial sense of place? Um, yes, you can take pictures. These numbers were done in about 48 hours, so <laughs> I take that with a grain of salt. Don't hold the so we look at this across the same three phases that, that uh, Julie just talked through, the early, mid-range, and long-range. The early phase being, like, what are those immediate dollars you need to spend to create that great sense of place on the water that will ultimately define what this area of North Woodbridge is going to be? Uh, that came to about $35 million. Uh, these values were based on components of other developments around the region that we've been involved with in our different firms in terms of you know, other parks and infrastructure projects across the region. But that initial investment of $35 million essentially establishes the bid. This project is going to be at least 15 years in implementation. You need an entity to see it through that process. It'll carry through you know, changes in political leadership, changes in other you know, dynamics and industry changes, market changes. You need someone to sustain that in implementation throughout that period. So that'll be one of the first components is funding the establishment of the Business Improvement District, um, funding interim parking for the ferry and other uses. Uh, looking for you know, starting the future planning um, for the multimodal center, for some of the public investment, just starting the planning activities for that, those investments. Uh, investing in the, the, the boat launch, kayak launch, as a way to get more people down to the waterfront, <coughs> as well as investing in that initial riverfront park, which initially might just be grass, a place to come and convene, but over time you might invest in other improvements and amenities to actually further activate that park. Uh, in the midterm, uh, we're looking at some of the bigger investments that begin to truly create the, the transit node. Uh, the multi tra multimodal transit facility is being built in this phase. Uh, the total budget here is $80 million, includes that facility, it includes the dockside promenade that connects along the waterfront and converts the private marine into more of a public space. Uh, it also includes the park in the Midlands area as well as a library community facility as part of the mid-range planning. Uh, in the long range, we've now worked our way to the top of the hill. We're in that densest part of the area. Uh, we're looking at you know, the large town center park, uh, a public school or other facility site, as well as some of the bicycle ped river connections and trails that would complete the National Historic uh, Scenic Trail, as well as the nature trail throughout the, the scenic wetlands. So that comes to about $215 million that we're looking for to actually invest into the public infrastructure, public facilities, and, and, and civic uh, facilities as part of this project. Um, the one easy way could be to ask the supervisor uh, to write us a check for $250 million, and we're off to the races. Um, however, we see the more realist approach is looking at a, a different stack of funding that involves both public and private sources. Um, initially, we do think there will be a county investment to see that initial phase of development, just to create that initial sense of identity. Uh, and this could be for early public infrastructure, such as the interim parking, uh, or some of the, you know, the riverfront park, just the initial kind of getting the area going, uh, and also looking to tap into the proposed $1 billion mobility bond as a potential source of funding to get some of those initial components uh, off the ground. Uh, we also see private investment as being a very key source of funding uh, throughout the entire implementation of this project, uh, leveraging the fact that this area falls within a federal opportunity zone, which makes it more attractive for private investment to, to put their dollars into this area. Uh, looking at Federal Transit Administration funding. So this is already being contemplated for the ferry itself, but also looking at the multimodal center, some of those connections, and can we find other sources of funding to actually fund those you know, transit-related, mobility-related investments in the site. Uh, we also want to establish a tax increment financing district over the entire North Woodbridge area. Essentially, given the fact that a lot of it's vacant land or vacant shopping centers or underutilized property, 
Uh, now is the best time to do that, because the way to capture the largest increment over time as this area does develop, and use that increment to reinvest right back into this area to fund some of those infrastructure investments and in public facilities. And then lastly, using the Business Improvement District as a source of funding for ongoing maintenance and activation. The flow of assessments from that won't actually fund major capital investments, but it'll actually help you maintain the area, help you with branding and marketing to change the nature of the area, as well as activation to create more events that actually bring people down to, to the water into this neighborhood. So that is our you know, very draft plan, but the initial step is to you know, dive deeper into all these components and truly understand the cost and how to actually match the best sources of financing against those individual costs and components. Michael Rafferty, yeah. take us home. <laughs> but I think I'm going to ask Al. He's a yoga guy to come up and do a five-minute yoga session. So we can <laughs> this okay, for that, or else we're going to get on Match Talk since we're talking about data. So just wanted to leave you with a couple of big ideas that we want to reinforce. And, and, and hopefully you, you leave inspired by this. I know it's a lot to absorb, and we've invested a lot of brain power on this, but we've had a lot of fun, and we think this is such a critical project. But open space and the access to the river is one of your fundamental definition points for this part of North Woodbridge. Um, I think water is magic, and people want to be near it, and people want to live near it, and people want to recreate on it. And I think having a dock that is more than a ferry terminal, I encourage all of you to go to the wharf and see the three public piers they put out into the waterway that serve as more than docking facilities. They're actually recreational things that invite people out to see the water up close and personal and sit by fire pits and sit in swings and listen to concerts and then come to Yards Park and see how our front porch works overlooking the river. You need an urban street grid and I think that's what makes this an urban walkable community. The opportunity to turn corners and sense excitement and visit shops and then have this way, marina way, all the way down to the river that everyone's going to enjoy. And that's that series of experiences that this should be experiential and have some authenticity and be based on the history, but have it a sequence of experience through those well-designed and well-programmed parks. This transit hub that unites all over other forms of transportation, we think is imperative to organize that and start implementing it. <coughs> And then investment in the public infrastructure. I love that yeah, the first date is that the, the county is going to put the money out there and invite the private sector to the dance. I am a beneficiary at the Capitol Riverfront of $1.1 billion of public investment in infrastructure and parks and new bridges and baseball and soccer stadiums. That's going to leverage by 20 $8.7 billion in new tax revenue. So it more than pays for itself and the baseline maintenance of our neighborhood. It's going to leverage over $11 billion of private redevelopment. These are substantial undertakings, but having that public sector seed money does a lot to leverage. And we've talked about the corridors, these transportation corridors, and it's always this north-south dialogue. Well, we want to shift the paradigm and start you thinking about an east-west dialogue. And that's the relationship to the river and how you get there. And I think that's very important to think. It takes you out of the, the idea that these corridors are our lifeblood, where I think the river is your lifeblood in a way as well. And finally, keep the future in mind. Transportation is ever evolving. We're going to have autonomous vehicles, which will change the character of how we use the public right-of-way of the street and parking lanes. There are going to be scooters coming to Woodbridge. I saw them in proliferation in San Antonio. They have come in proliferation to DC, and it really is a great way to get around a, a city without a segue. So you've got to have a little bit of balance and wear a helmet, but it's really going to be a big fun, and it'll take us back to our childhood. There are new ways to work. You don't have to be going to downtown DC or ne necessarily all the naval or the military bases all the time. You can go to a WeWork. You can go to dedicated incubator or IT centers and have a landing pad. You can rent office space by the hour, by the day, by the week, by the month, by the year, rent conference facilities and all those separate things. So think about that this becomes a live, work, and play community. Think about resilient development. Uh, you're on the edge of a river. There's going to be sea level rise. It's already occurring. There's going to be climate change, more violent storms, more rain. We're on record to have the rainiest uh, year in Washington's history. And it's going to start tomorrow night when it rains and rains all day Friday and Saturday. That's when we break the record. So you need to take into account the 100-year floodplain is now the 500-year floodplain. That's the new norm. So designed to that resiliency, 
Know that you have natural flood areas that can absorb some of it in the wetlands, but plan private development with that in mind. In looking at your demographics, we learned that Woodbridge and Prince William County is a diverse community, and you should celebrate that diversity. Our parks are considered common ground for all ages, all genders, all ethnicities, um, and all age groups. And it's really interesting to see that meshing of that, and this new community can be perceived as common ground to everyone. We're part of the International Downtown Association, and the slogan was, Downtown is Common Ground for Everyone. Well, I think what we have just drafted off with the sub-area plan creates common ground based on the river and based on the high ground with the town center. And it's going to be a long-term investment that pays off in dividends, not only in quality of life, but in expanding your tax base and making this a higher quality of life place to live. And I think Frank is going to come up and close this out, and then we're going to be available for <coughs> questions. I think we may have had one more slide. Yes. But thank you for your attention tonight. We appreciate you spending the time with us. Let's give it up one more time for Michael Stevens. It was very eye-opening, very bold. That's what you asked for. Uh, that's right. I'm not sure who was more giddy, me or Rebecca Horner, right, uh, as planners in the community. And uh, so thank you very much for uh, coming and visiting with us and uh, leaving behind some of your expertise and experience and perspective. Uh, I am in between uh, this presentation and the Q&A session, uh, but I don't think we'll do it service tonight unless we talk very briefly about the fourth study released this week uh, by Northern Virginia Regional Commission, who's here with us tonight, uh, and their consultant and contractor, Nelson Nygaard. Uh, and so what I want to do is just uh, go over a few of the highlights of this particular report. This is the fourth report on Fast Ferry for uh, Eastern Prince William. The first one came out by VDOT, Virginia Department of Transportation, uh, in 2001. Prince William County uh, conducted a study in 2009. Uh, we did a market analysis in the region. Uh, if we build it, will they come? Uh, and, and release that in 2015 and 2016. Uh, and uh, here we are with the fourth one. Uh, I'm getting a little tired of studies. I'm ready to implement. And if, we can just, if we can just cut that 15-year timeline in half, I'll be very happy. Um, and so, uh, uh, if you just bear with me here, um, uh, the uh, important uh, conclusion, the most important conclusion from this study is that, in fact, uh, we believe that based on our analysis, we have a fast ferry service that is technically feasible, uh, commercially viable, uh, and would be in part of a growing market of passengers uh, who would use it. Uh, today we know that there are 6,000 current work trips uh, from a 30-minute drive of this marina and people who work every day at Joint Base Anacostia Bowling and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, not all 6,000 individuals will take the ferry, but if we got 10% or 15%, my guess is working with the vessel owner operators and their business plan, that's going to be adequate to start this service uh, soon. Um, it's also attracted because of the time savings associated <clears throat> with taking the ferry. Today, our analysis shows that if you live within a 30-minute radius of this site where we're at tonight, uh, and uh, you're going to JBAB or Homeland Security by vehicle, that is 95, 495 to 295, the average AM commute is 90 minutes. That's the average. It gets worse, and I suppose it could be a little bit faster. If you look at the ferry service that we're talking about here tonight, we can do it in 45 to 50 minutes. Now that doesn't include, does not include the drive from home to this location. But certainly uh, from here to JBAB and Homeland Security, uh, we're cutting the time in half. And time sensitivity, fair price, uh, and reliability of service is really the three factors that we're having to drive uh, home on to be able to make this successful. The service plan, uh, what we're talking about today, and this has evolved uh, over time, uh, is a uh, uh, up to three 
90 foot long high speed catamarans that would lift up out of the water, reduce the wake and wash that environmentalists and recreational boaters are concerned about, uh, and be able to move 400 passengers on each vessel. What you see today in the district are four water taxis that hold 149 passengers serving the wharf, Georgetown, uh, National Harbor, and Old Town Alexandria. All we're suggesting is that we need to expand that service further south here to the Occoquan and get us some larger boats because we're going to have a lot of people who are going to want to take the service to work. The service we would offer initially would be AM and PM rush hour only. I think there's also some consideration about a lunchtime run uh, between those uh, two points uh, to get people back to work uh, back home. Uh, top speed of 48 knots, that's not the average speed, but the top speed, which is equivalent to about 55 miles an hour. So these are not slow boats. These are high speed catamarans getting us uh, to and from the, the region. Uh, and uh, our best estimate today with regard to passenger fares would be a base fare of $30 round trip from here to JBAB and back. Unless, of course, you use the federal transit card that is worth $12 round trip. It is a subsidy that could be used to offset the 30. So if you follow me on the math, it's 30 is the base, minus $12 gets us to about 18 to $19. And when we look at how, it, if that's competitive with the toll lanes, anybody, anybody been on the toll lanes recently? This would be a bargain, number one. Number two, if you compare it against BRE, commuter service, because we have the station uh, right here on Route 1, uh, round trip to uh, uh, LaFont Plaza, because BRE doesn't go to JBAB or Homeland Security. Uh, you'd have to take uh, a bus or drive to uh, 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 Metro uh, and then take a shuttle bus to Homeland Security and JBAP. Uh, that cost is about twelve, fourteen dollars uh, with a monthly pass. So you know we're in the ballpark with VRA, uh, and so uh, uh, this is sort of my vision of fast ferry service. Now, I'll have to tell you that uh, uh, I think Peggy uh, Tadej with NBRC uh, went on vacation last summer, uh, went to the fjords, uh, and rode this vessel, and sent me back this picture, and, and in the email, was, ha, 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 I'm riding a vessel, and you're not. <laughs> this is an all-electric vehicle that holds 400 passengers. I'm not sure we would start with these, but eventually we'll get here. Uh, a beautiful vessel, multi-level, seating indoor, uh, seating outdoor, uh, and uh, my favorite part, uh, food and, and beverage service, uh, uh, reclining leather seats, free Wi-Fi, watching CNN on the monitor. Uh, this is how we commute in the National Capital Region, <laughs> not looking at the license plate, the bumper uh, in the vehicle in front of us on 95. <laughs> Why Occoquan? We've heard a lot tonight about why Occoquan. Clearly, as part of a larger activity center or town center uh, with the public uh, uh, dock and uh, recreational activities, it's a critical uh, location to put this. Uh, the transit triangle you referred to. I think building some resiliency and redundancy in our transit options is important. So yeah, there will be a few days a year where ice will be on the river and you may be planning to take the ferry into work, okay, uh, and we'll be able to do so because of the ice in the water. And, uh, you know, that's probably uh, eight to 10 days a year is what we're estimating. But hey, if you could take that shuttle service that we want to operationalize between the three points of the triangle, it's an easy ride over to VRE or up to the uh, V.123 commuter lot to slug or take a bus uh, into where you're going. Uh, that's, that said, there are some real infrastructure needs right here to be able to make this happen. The study uh, estimates somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half million dollars to make this location uh, viable and to be able to launch fast ferry service. And some of those improvements that are needed uh, include parking, uh, a dock upgrade, uh, and we're also uh, speaking with the developers, the owners of the property here about completing Annapolis Way. Because you know, if you live in this area, Annapolis Way has two dead ends, and you can't get in between. 
And so we're talking with the developers and county uh, staff about how we're going to be able to finance that internal road network that uh, Mike and others mentioned. Why join Base Anacostia Bowling? Again, primary reason is the market. We know the best market out of this area is going to JBAB and Homeland Security. And as you know, at Homeland Security, that's a growing market, right? We have uh, US Coast Guard already there. Uh, and they start at 4.30 in the morning. And my guess is we could have ferry service ready for them every day at uh, 3.30, 3.45 a.m. and get them to work on time. Uh, there are obviously parking constraints uh, at JBAB and Homeland Security. They only have so much capacity for parking. And we're going to help them out with that by bringing people without their vehicles uh, on this uh, uh, passenger ferry service. Uh, and then on the JBAB side, uh, our report estimates about another three and a half to four million for the capital improvements that are needed at JBAB. Uh, we have a grant uh, that is currently open with the federal government agency. Uh, we've requested uh, one million dollars to start the JBAB design and engineering. Uh, and I should say that we are already sitting on an FTA grant award, Federal Transit Administration award, for the necessary, all of the necessary improvements at this location. So we're well on our way to building the infrastructure and the docks uh, and the parking and the handrails and the night lights and the walkways that we need here at, uh, at Arctic. What's next? Uh, there's a lot of work still to be done, unfortunately. I like to think of ferry service being able to launch in 2022. Is that the, uh, is that the year that we're focused on? Uh, 2021, 20, that's quicker than you all are suggesting on the, on the town center. Uh, and so um, I feel very strongly as the stakeholder group does, the regional stakeholder group that sort of owns this project, uh, that we need to continuously hone in on the market research. Just a couple weeks ago, Amazon just announced 25,000 new jobs for national landing. Can we carry some of those folks? Because I know they're coming to Prince William to live here. It's a great place to live, work, and play. Could we potentially carry Amazon employees uh, to National Landing? We've been looking at the airport as a potential dock uh, destination site uh, as well as part of the study. Uh, we have 600 residents of Woodbridge, not Prince William, but Woodbridge, that work at MGM every day. There's another market. Belmont Bay is not fully built out uh, as a town center, and there's going to be more development more residential units, more retail, more office uh, coming to Belmont Bay. So I believe uh, we are in a growing market uh, and we need to uh, have a, an additional transit service uh, to serve them. Uh, Shoreside infrastructure capital, we need to continue to raise money for that. Uh, we are planning a request for information. We've had three different ferry owner operators on the stakeholder group over the last several years. People who, companies who actually operate ferries in this and other parts of the country. Uh, and uh, we're gonna have to uh, ask for a date here because it's a lot like a dance. The, the, the disco ball is spinning, the music is on, right? And some of us are dancing, but in order to make this get the next step going, we're gonna have to ask for a date with a vessel owner operator. Because under the public-private military partnership that we're proposing here, we're going to need the vessel owner operator to bring the boats. The 400 passenger vessels that we're looking at uh, is approximately $10 million each. And if we're talking about three to start with, that's a $30 million investment. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we've honed in on the market. We've got this great town center that we're planning as well. Uh, and we're making it real for the business that's going to take on that risk and be able to operationalize with this vision. And then the stakeholder group, uh, 40 organizations, local, state, federal government, military, uh, base commanders, private sector, academics, consultants uh, that have been meeting for several years under the auspices of NBRC. We may need to take that group to a new level, from a stakeholder group to a more of a governing body. And uh, that was some of the recommendations I saw uh, in your slide deck. So we've got our work cut out for us. This is not going to happen overnight. Uh, and we certainly need your support, your buy-in, uh, and your feedback on all of this. So